new regulations and guidelines. So let's listen to Dr. Nirav Shah, the head like of the main CDC. I'd like to provide on the number of cases of COVID-19 before handing things over to Governor Mills. As of this morning, the main CDC is reporting a total of 42 cases of COVID-19 across the state. That includes an increase in 14 cases since yesterday. All told, of those 42 cases, 30 are positive and have been confirmed by our state laboratory here in Augusta, 12 are labeled as presumptive positives and are awaiting confirmation. I'd like to just run through the numbers just very, very quickly to ensure that there's no confusion. Yesterday we noted that there were 32 cases, today there are 42. And there are also 14 new cases. So just to clear up the arithmetic very quickly, um, yesterday, uh, in, in total, there have been 14 new cases. However, in that, <clears throat> we have also transferred three cases to the state of residence of those individuals. The way that state health departments work on cases where an individual is in Maine, but from another state, is that we ask the state health department where the individual is a resident to oversee that case. And so that case is transferred over to them. So three of the cases that we discussed yesterday have been transferred to the respective state health departments. In terms of the overall cases that we have, of those 42, four are hospitalized. In terms of the testing numbers, in the state of Maine, there have been a total of 1,670 negative tests. The Maine CDC staff and our epidemiologists have fielded approximately 2,230 consults since our activation began. I'm also able to report that one of our cases has now recovered per a discussion that we had yesterday. Very quickly, I'd like to provide a county by county breakdown of where those cases are. In Androscoggin County, there are three cases. In Cumberland County, there are 23 cases. Kennebec County, one case. Lincoln County, three cases. Oxford County, one case. Penobscot County, one case. York County, two cases. And as of right now, eight cases are under investigation. Those are cases that we just received notification of just in the past few hours. Before I turn things over to Governor Mills, I'd like to note again that in the past several weeks, the scientific community has learned quite a bit about coronavirus. We've learned that over 80% of individuals who have coronavirus disease or COVID-19 have mild symptoms and those individuals can stay at home. We've also learned that community transmission continues to spread across the United States. How those factors interact and manifest in the outbreak that we are facing here in the state of Maine is something that the Maine CDC team is looking at on an hour by hour basis. And we will continue to keep everyone updated on how the mild versus severe symptoms play out and how the progression of community transmission plays out and how that interacts with the need for things like testing. Much more to come on that. Governor Mills. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Anna, could you stand back a little bit? Give me some space. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you all for being here. You know that we're living in unprecedented times in the history of our state and the history of our nation. Uh, just now, Dr. Shah reported that Maine has recorded 30 confirmed and 12 presumptive positive cases of COVID-19. And we also have the first individual who has fully recovered from COVID-19. We're pleased with that. 
But today, in light of these new cases and uh, those anticipated, those expected to come, I am taking more aggressive action to mitigate the spread of the coronavirus in our state and to protect the health and welfare of Maine people. First, under the authority granted to me during an emergency, state of civil emergency, I am issuing an executive order today mandating that all restaurants and bars statewide close to dine-in customers effective today at 6 p.m. This order will extend for the next 14 days through midnight March 31st, and it is subject to review and renewal. Carry out deliver, home delivery and drive-through food and beverage service may continue, but eating and drinking inside restaurants and bars is temporarily prohibited. We're taking this step, this aggressive step, to prevent transmission among people being in close proximity to one another. To those restaurants and bars that offer carryout or delivery or drive-through service, I strongly urge them to employ social distancing best practices. And to the people of Maine, I strongly urge all of you to continue to support our establishments by purchasing takeout meals or by buying gift cards or other measures of support. Secondly, I am prohibiting all gatherings of more than 10 people, those that are primarily social, personal, or discretionary events that are not work-related. These gatherings include, but are not limited to, community, civic, public, leisure, faith-based events, social clubs, sporting, sporting events with spectators, concerts, conventions, fundraisers, parades, fairs, and festivals, and any similar event or activity in a venue such as an auditorium, stadium, arena, large conference room, meeting hall, theater, gymnasium, fitness center, or private club. This prohibition is consistent with the latest recommendations from the US CDC, and it applies uniformly across the state. I will review this order as well prior to its expiration and determine the need to revise and or renew it. In addition, while I'm not mandating, I would strongly urge non-essential public-facing businesses, such as gyms, hair salons, theaters, casinos, shopping malls, to close their doors for the next two weeks to minimize public gatherings and the spread of the virus. This would not include businesses that provide essential services, including, for instance, food processing, agricultural, industrial manufacturing, construction, trash collection, grocery and household goods, convenience stores, home repair and hardware, auto repair, pharmacy, other medical facilities, health care, child care, post offices, shipping outlets, insurance, banks, gas stations, laundromats, veterinary clinics, animal feed stores, shipping facilities, public transportation, hotel and commercial lodging. And although those businesses may remain open, I am strongly urging all Maine people and those businesses to implement social distancing measures and to be thoughtful about the need to visit businesses. Other businesses, for instance, business and management consulting, legal and professional services, insurance, they are encouraged to have employees work remotely, if, if at all possible. If not possible, I urge employees to implement social distancing best practices. I do not take these steps lightly. Maine's businesses and their workers are the backbone of our economy. And I understand that these actions will not only impact them, but will also disrupt the lives of Maine people, people who work at and eat at our renowned restaurants and bars. However, COVID-19 continues to spread across Maine, 
and experts have been clear that implementing social distancing that, in, that includes these measures is the most effective method to mitigate its spread and to protect public health. My administration is also committed to working with affected businesses and people whose employment is affected by COVID-19. I've secured approval from the US, U.S. Small Business Administration for Maine businesses to access loans that will help replace critical capital that they have lost. And we have temporarily revised eligibility and allowed expedited approval for unemployment benefits for those unable to work as a result of COVID-19 without impacting employers' experience ratings. And signing the emergency omnibus bill passed last night by the legislature will establish a consumer loan guarantee program through the Finance Authority of Maine in partnership with financial institutions to provide low or no interest, low or no interest loans for people affected by the COVID-19 outbreak. I have asked Heather Johnson, Commissioner of Department of Economic and Community Development, and Laura Fortman, Commissioner of the Department of Labor, to evaluate all options to support small businesses and Maine workers. And we are also hoping that Congress and the President will soon do their part. My administration will work tirelessly to respond to this virus and to mitigate its spread. I will do everything within my power to protect the health and welfare of Maine people. I continue to strongly urge all Maine people to take seriously the threat of this virus and to practice social distancing. We all have a responsibility to do our part. In these unprecedented, uncertain times, I'm reminded of what Mr. Rogers said, quote, when I was young, he said, and I would see scary things on the news, my mother would say, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. The helpers are everywhere in Maine. They are cooking meal, meals for children. They are providing shelter for the homeless. They are providing care to those in need. They are watching and listening this morning, keeping their distance from others to preserve our state and our spaces for tomorrow staying apart now in order that we will stay safe in the future, keeping those distances to bring us together again. Maine is sacrificing, but Maine is standing strong. Maine people are strong. We all know it will get worse before it gets better, but it will get better and we will get through this. With that, I will be signing several bills enacted by the legislature yesterday evening. Excuse me, can you? Thank you. The first is the supplemental budget, LB 2126. And I see the Senate President here, his signature is on the page as of yesterday. And I am pleased to sign this on March 18, 2020. This supplemental budget, as you know, provides $73 million for funding especially uh, focused on our response to the COVID-19 outbreak and to mitigating its effects. <clears throat> Secondly, LD 2167, also enacted yesterday evening, and signed by the Speaker and the Pre Senate President yesterday. And this bill provides necessary resources and legal uh, remedies for us to use to respond to the COVID-19 uh, emergency, including expansion of unemployment benefits, which will not impact employers' experience rating, but will waive the one week uh, waiting period that is ordinarily in effect and will expedite processing those applications and provide expanded uh, grounds for, for uh, claiming unemployment because of the COVID-19 outbreak. Those two things are now law. I thank you and uh, 
invite your questions. Governor, how difficult is it for you to order these additional steps? How hard a decision was that? <clears throat> Each one of these steps is difficult because you know there are ramifications for hard-working main businesses and main people working in those businesses. And, uh, you know, to walk down the streets of Portland and Bangor or any of our towns and cities and when they look almost like a ghost town, it's pretty disheartening. But we know that main people want to be safe. We want our children and our elders and those most likely affected by this outbreak to be safe and to lead productive lives. I think the most heartening statistic I heard a few minutes ago is that one person at least has now completely recovered from the virus. We hope that all 42 individuals will completely recover. In the meantime, avoiding close spaces with others is the best means to avoid that spread. What impact did some of the cities uh, in the past couple of days um, making steps in their Many of them voluntarily closed. I mean, it was St. Patrick's Day, one of the biggest business days for bars and restaurants in Maine, and it was a tough one. Uh, but now uh, we've, got to, we've got to make this universal so that it's fair and so that it has the biggest impact on reducing gatherings and reducing the spread of the virus. You know, this includes, I know Troy Jackson's a bowler. He's not going to be able to go bowling this week, you know. <laughs> He's looking very distraught. <laughs> I like, I like to go to the movies. I'm not going to the movies. I like to go out to eat now and then. You know, the things that we've all sort of taken for granted for many years, our lifestyles are changing for now, but we will get through this. Things will get better. Yes, sir. Uh, just a couple of things. Um, can you clarify the impact of the new orders on soup kitchens? And uh, secondly, I just have questions in general about homelessness. Um, obviously, <clears throat> homeless especially in Portland, um, they don't necessarily have the luxury of um, practicing social distance. So are there any special guidelines that are going out to homeless shelters? Yeah. And uh, one thing I heard that the city of Portland is doing is um, having people sleep head to toe to create distance. And I'm hmm. just wondering if that's an effective strategy. I'm not going to mandate head to toe sleeping, but we have been working with uh, hospitals and local health departments, apartments. Uh, and the university and other entities, and I think uh, Commissioner Lambrew can talk about some of those discussions we've had about identifying the best places in every city's different, uh, and different cities have and different soup numbers. Kitchens too, soup kitchens too. Need in there. Right, it's, that's a difficult space, and we would encourage uh, takeout only. But go ahead. Sure. So the challenge of homeless populations really does span departments. The Maine State Housing Authority, for example, is working with us. It spans city, county, and state boundaries as well. So we are assembling a team that's meeting more than once a day, typically, to try to figure out two solutions. One is how do we provide space for people who are homeless to have the social distancing that they need? Second, if they need to self-isolate or be quarantined, where can they go? And third, to your question about soup kitchens, how do we ensure we are ensuring food security at a time when we're trying to minimize social distancing? Those are three different types of activities. We are working with the food banks, with the city of Portland, the city of Bangor. Uh, Lewison has a homeless shelter for at-risk youth. We are working with all of them to try to find pragmatic solutions that are public, privately done to ensure homeless people, like other residents of Maine, can stay safe. And uh, Dr. Shaw, is the head-to-toe sleeping, I mean, is that social distancing? Does that work? Uh, there, that's, it's a good question. There's probably need more research in order to know. But right now, this is a situation in which everyone is doing the best that they can. Uh, and so we, we, we certainly encourage all innovative solutions and ideas. Governor, what about construction sites or places like Bath Ironworks where people are, are, are working in large numbers? What are your thoughts on that? We're not, uh, we're not addressing in, we're not addressing industrial sites, commercial sites of that sort. We're talking about public facing uh, businesses like gyms and bowling alleys and movie theaters and whatnot. 
each business has to, and we're recommending that each business uh, be flexible with working hours and working spaces and places, minimizing um, uh, proximity of working people, uh, minimizing the spread. Yeah, we talked about that the other day and recommended that they close for the time being, but not, or not close, the classroom instruction <laughs> and for the time being. There's a difference. Schools in some districts are able to stay open. The facility can stay open. Uh, schools in some districts have uh, lunch programs that they're expanding and delivering by school bus to the kids in the community. Uh, schools in many districts are incorporating tele-ed, as it were, encouraging kids to stay online and get lessons online. I read in the paper this morning that uh, some schools, are, along with the backpacks or food uh, uh, supplements, the food um, uh, lunch boxes, they're also sending home their homework. Um, so they're being creative. Each district is different. Each physical plant, each physical school is different. We're encouraging that flexibility. We want our kids to keep learning and keep being healthy. Heather, um, and this may be a question that Dr. Shaw might want to help answer. Um, we keep hearing about um, a large provider in Cumberland County, I can't say who it is right now, who is running critically low on personal protective equipment. And they're getting to a point where they're having to tell people who would probably otherwise be tested to quarantine at home. And there's a concern that those people are being lost within the community. This is a Cumberland County case where you're already seeing community spread. What, what can we do to help those folks? We are certainly aware of this challenge, both in Maine and nationwide. Ensuring adequate supplies, uh, so I'm, and I'm, for the benefit of viewers, I've been asked to repeat questions. Uh, Steve's question is, uh, how should we think about and address the shortage of protective equipment equipment that's used by healthcare providers and first responders across the st state. Uh, we are certainly aware of this concern, as are my colleagues in all other, uh, the other 50 or other 49 states. This shortage of protective equipment has been a challenge and a concern from day one. Uh, we at the Maine CDC, uh, working with the administration overall, have been doing a few things to try to beef up the supplies that we've got. The first is that we early on requested a distribution from the strategic national stockpile managed by the federal government for additional supplies of protective equipment. That distribution is, is, is coming in. Um, it, it, most critically, the distribution of N95 masks that we requested has come in. That's approximately 12,700 N95 masks. We, of course, are wasting no time in making sure those get distributed to the most critical providers who need them right now for the very things that you mentioned, which is to say ensuring that healthcare workers can treat patients as well as have appropriate protection in order to test patients. Right now, the main CDC has one testing kit that we previously have talked about, as well as a second kit. Each kit is able to conduct, in per kit, approximately 1,000 tests. Uh, the main, I, I, we will get you the exact number of tests that the laboratory here in Augusta has completed. However, a concern that has come up across the nation in the past few days is the availability of not just the kits, but the other pieces of, that are necessary in order to undertake testing. In a sense, testing is like baking something. There are a lot of different ingredients. The oven uh, is sort of similar to the machines that we've got, but there are other ingredients that are necessary. And across the country, in recent days, my counterparts have been in discussions with the US CDC to get a better sense of what the availability of those other supplies are. These are things like the enzymes that are needed to run the tests themselves, as well as the nasal swabs that healthcare workers use in order to actually draw the sample. 
those 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 supplies are, and the supply of them has been a concern. It's something that we are keeping very close tabs on. It's all the more reason we are keeping a very open line of communication with, for example, the Strategic National Stockpile and the U.S. CDC. Uh, but it is something that we are concerned about. Are you, are you she questions? had a question over here. Yep. Our focus for that funding is really in threefold, threefold. The first is to try to make sure that our public health nurse, public health nursing workforce is as robust as possible. In situations of this sort, where individuals are at home and may need social services and health care, our public health nurses are on the front line. The second area that we, were, we, we would like to use that funding for, for which we are very thankful, um, is to ensure that our laboratory, again, has all the ingredients necessary to be able to try to run as many tests as possible for the patients who require them. The third thing is to use that funding to supplement or fill in the gaps that may exist from the federal funding that the state of Maine has or, or is about to receive. Hiring has been a challenge but it's something that will be more easily to ex will, it is something that can be expedited more easily in light of the governor's emergency declaration again to repeat the question the question was how much more easily will public health nursing be able to be hired and in light of the governor's declaration we believe that will be something that will be easier nevertheless still a challenge question for the governor uh, governor I, I hate to be gloomy but having heard some people Say Maine needs to follow the example of some other states and shut everything down if possibly can. Have you talked about is there a threshold at which you take tougher action? It, which I take what? Take uh, tougher action, even more stringent action. This is pretty aggressive action. Ask any of the restaurants or bars who are going to be losing tremendous business. This is pretty aggressive action. Telling people they can't congregate in groups of more than 10 is pretty aggressive action across the state of Maine. Um, and actually, our actions today are not dissimilar to those of, say, Pennsylvania and certain other states uh, where they've done pretty similar things and made strong recommendations about public-facing businesses, but not mandates. We're uh, being measured. The situation is evolving. We're responding to the figures every day and trying to be ahead of the puck, as they say, as Wayne Gretzky says, not uh, focusing on where the puck is, but where the puck will be going. Yes. Was there any, was there any consideration to maybe a stay-in-place order? No. And to follow that question, so is there then a, a CDC difference between a place of work and a gathering place, like a restaurant, like why one place would stay open that has a higher number of people and why one place would be ordered closed? Public-facing businesses, I think we talked about. Was that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Any, one more, perhaps? Governor Milton? Maine Revenue Services or um, DAPS, have they done a, any sort of assessment of what the impact of this may be in various scenarios? I know it's early. The economic impact. Exactly. Economic sure. Impact. It's on my mind every day. Yeah. <laughs> it's on everybody's minds. Uh, and we have to take it day to day, see how long this is going to be before we flatten that curve, save people's lives first and foremost. Uh, the economy is going to change clearly. I think we know that nationally. We look at the uh, roller coaster ride in the stock market in the last couple of weeks. But I'm not an economist. I'll be speaking with economists. But I think it changes day to day what the uh, prospects are. I'm not an economic forecaster, so I'm not going to I'm not going to venture a guess. Anything else, real quickly? Do I have a plan to enforce it? There are a number of enforcement mechanisms. I don't need to go into them today, but uh, the statutes and the emergency provisions in law give me multiple uh, enforcement mechanisms. Thank you very much. We have a couple for Dr. Sean. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Sorry. He's got to get back and do some testing, too. <laughs> yeah. He's a critical employee. <laughs> Happy to take some questions. What he was saying earlier,
the question is, um, has guidance around testing changed? Nationwide, as well as in other jurisdictions, cities and states, have recently started looking at who should be tested. What we know about the coronavirus test is a few things. One is something that we've discussed at length, which is ensuring that those who are tested have symptoms. If you test someone with th who does not have symptoms, it's impossible to know what a negative result means. In addition to that, other jurisdictions are looking at how to think about testing in a world where community transmission is occurring. If coronavirus is more akin to the flu, then how does that impact who should be tested? Does it mean that, for example, only individuals who are in a hospital should be tested? Does it mean that we should test healthcare workers and emergency medical providers, first responders? So those are questions that other jurisdictions are looking at. They're questions that we're looking at as well, partly because we want to make sure that every single person who needs a test can get a test and ensure that when we get results, we can interpret them properly. Hence the concern about testing individuals who don't have symptoms. It's something that my team and I are evaluating, again, very, multiple times per day. I sit down and meet with our medical team, our epidemiology team, and, and our experts in interpretation of laboratory results. We're also keeping tabs on what the US CDC is saying as well. This has been anticipated. What we've seen in other parts of the world, as well as other states, is that when viruses like coronavirus, which has the potential to move quickly in a population, when it has been introduced, the time between the first introduction and the finding of cases in other parts of the area is pretty short. The experience in Maine is consistent with what we've seen in other parts of the, uh, other parts of the state. Sorry, other parts of the country. Um, what we look at now is not so much where the first cases are, because we know those are coming. We're also keeping an eye out on when we see evidence of community transmission. Again, community transmission looks makes coronavirus, or how we think about it, is to equate coronavirus to something like the flu, which is to say it's not 100% certain whether you got coronavirus from someone, your own personal travels, or someone close to you who traveled somewhere recently. And that's what we've seen in Cumberland County, and given what we've seen elsewhere, what we expect to happen in other parts of the state as well. Can I ask uh, the same question I sort of asked everyone else a little more clearly this time? <laughs> was a workplace safer because there were the same people coming from the same places as opposed to different people coming from different places? Right? That's what I was trying to ask her. It's more the latter. So the question is, um, how should we think about workplaces? And one of the, there, there are two ways to distinguish workplaces from other types of businesses that Governor Mills has noted. The first is that workplaces, for the most part, are not areas of tight concentration. A workplace is not usually like a crowded bar on a Friday night. Secondly, most workplaces are not public facing. The public facing element is important for two reasons. The first is that the individuals who work there might be exposed and themselves may become ill. The other reason that workplaces are different or that, we, uh, that the concern is different is that we also want to ensure that those who work in public spacing businesses, even if they may not become sick, aren't exposed and then carry the virus back to their families, to their elderly parents, their neighbors, and such things. So that's how, from an epidemiological perspective, we think about those things. Randy? Uh, just a couple more about uh, public health nurses. Is there a specific number of public health nurses um, you're looking to hire with the additional money? And secondly, can you talk a little bit more about what their role will be, will be as uh, more of these cases you know, go out in the community and more people are staying home? You got it. I'm going to take those in reverse order, because the answer to the latter somewhat governs the answer to the former. One of, uh, as an example, uh, and the, the answer uh, to repeat the question from Randy, uh, which is what is, the, what is the role of public health nurses in a situation like this with coronavirus? Um, and one of the ways in which we have, uh, right now, 
public health nurses are assisting our epidemiology force in doing two things, answering questions from the public and providers, and then also doing some of the investigations, that disease detective work that we've talked about. That's what they are working on right now, but they are simultaneously being prepared to deploy out more into the field. Once we shift, if we shift into that sort of field deployment, their missions will be twofold. The first will be to focus on wraparound social services for individuals who are under home isolation or quarantine. As we've talked about in these situations, in these meetings, we can't enter a world in which we forego other vital social and medical services only because of the coronavirus. We have to be able to keep both things going. The second area of field deployment for public health nurses will be in releasing people from isolation. There are two different categories. I'm not going to go into both of them right now, but according to the US CDC, there are two different criteria under which someone who has been diagnosed with coronavirus can be released. One set of criteria require follow-up testing. If someone is at home with coronavirus, we can't very well ask them to hop in the car or walk across town and go to a clinic or an emergency room and get tested. That defeats the entire purpose of everything we've been working on. So our plan is if that individual requires repeat testing, a public health nurse wearing appropriate protective equipment could be part of the, uh, the, the help for that. As you can see, the plans for the deployment of public health nurses are somewhat fluid. It depends on how the situation evolves. And that's why we are not sure exactly what our target number is, but we're looking at all options and then looking to staff appropriately. Dr. Shaw, So uh, Steve's question is, what can we say about the cases that we don't know about? And in any outbreak situation, any outbreak, whether that is influenza or Zika virus or any infectious disease outbreak, there is always the question of how much of the iceberg are we seeing? And that's just the nature of looking at infectious diseases. It's always a concern. The concern here is heightened for some reasons, and then it's lessened for others. The reasons that it's heightened. The first is that what we've seen recently is, uh, in, even in some papers that just came out last weekend, greater concern about the fact that individuals who don't yet have the disease can spread the disease. We talked about a couple of days ago how, in light of that new scientific data, Maine CDC actually in, uh, augmented the way that we're doing investigations, going from 14 days to 16 days. As you can imagine, if individuals who do not have symptoms are able to spread the disease in high numbers, that means that more of the iceberg is being unseen. On the other side, however, more data continued to reaffirm some of the initial findings that approximately 80 or so percent of individuals have mild symptoms that don't necessitate hospitalization. I don't want to minimize coronavirus for a second because that still means 14 to 20% of people have severe disease and we are very concerned about their well being. But there's a little bit of both. Bottom line, in any situation, we're always looking at how much of the iceberg we may not be seeing. I think I've got time for one last question. Well, how are the patients? The, the question is, uh, what can we say about how these individuals are faring? And let me say at the top that our absolute priority within the main CDC is to work with these individuals to ensure that they've got the best care that they need, and we wish them all the best on a speedy recovery. That's really why all of us who work in public health went into public health. Um, I was heartened that we now have our first recovered case. Uh, especially as it was something we discussed yesterday. That's coupled with the fact that we have four individuals who are in the hospital. I can't comment on their specific clinical conditions for privacy reasons. Uh, what I can say is that that rate of hospitalization 
four out of about 42 is consistent with some of the data that we just talked about. It's consistent with what we've seen in national data as well. We wish those individuals nothing but the best. Doctor, how would you characterize, okay. sorry, one more. Okay. How would you characterize um, when people know that they've recovered? Okay, that is a, it's a, the question is how do we know when individuals have recovered? In that respect, we follow the guidance documents from the US CDC. Uh, and there are two different criteria under which someone can be said to have recovered. I'm not going to go into those now. They are on the US CDC's website, and that's exactly the, the, the algorithm that we follow. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.